Hi, my name is Fritzi Horseman, and welcome to Compassion in Action. Today, my guest is Dr. Peter Levine. Dr. Levine is the founder of the Somatic Experience Trauma Institute. He's worked in the field of stress and trauma for over 40 years. He is the developer of the Somatic Experiencing Method. He's written several books on trauma, including Trauma and Memory, In an Unspoken Voice, and Waking the Tiger. Dr. Peter Levine, welcome to Compassion in Action. It's such an honor to have you on our podcast. I wanted to begin with a quote that you um, you have out there, and it's, trauma is a fact of life. It does not, however, have to be a life sentence. Yeah. Um, can you expand on that? Because this is a lot of the people in prison will be listening to this, and a lot of the people listening to this have a life sentence. Yeah. And many of the people are completely on guard all the time because there's of course a lot of danger there and it doesn't really allow people to settle and to feel okay in themselves at least enough to you know to go forward in life you know as i was saying you know i did a little work in prisons not a lot I did do some work with Sam Clinton. And I think part of it was because my father was in prison for a year. Long story there. But, uh, you know, and uh, when uh, I visited him, and then when I walked out, a guard came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, son, I want you to know that your dad's not a criminal. And uh, so, you know, I've I've always felt, and, oh, and he also said, and your father uh, made a library and he was teaching all the people skills. He was a teacher before he went in, skills that they could use on the outside. So hopefully maybe in some small way, I'm giving you some tools um, that you can use both on the inside and when you get to the outside. Um, and people think about trauma, Often it's something that happens to war veterans or in natural disasters. Um, and they, of course, it's true, but there are a lot of other sources of trauma and a lot of ways they will respond to trauma rather than being overwhelmed by it, being able to meet it and not be, yeah, and not be just destroyed by it. Um, so as we were talking, you know, it was really clear to me, and, and uh, I know a little bit about what it's like to be on the inside. Uh, and uh, I hope some of these tools can be helpful for you. So that's, that's, my, that's my desire, that's my desire. Um, also, uh, many people, most people think of trauma as something that happens in the brain, in the mind and the brain. And definitely the brain and the mind are affected by trauma. But when I first started to really discover what trauma was, I learned pretty quickly that trauma is at least something that happens inside the body and gets recycled or recircled you know, in the body and the mind, again, saying that threat's here, you can't let go of threat. It's not possible to make contact with somebody and to make caring contact, compassionate contact with, you know, with somebody else. And uh, so briefly, when something happens that is, frightens us or we see somebody, for example, who's injured, and our guts go, oh, well, what happens, and this is maybe a little bit complicated, is there's a nerve in the body, in the brain, that goes from the brain, the back of the brain, the brain stem, down through our whole bodies. It goes below the, all of the organs below the diaphragm. So it goes to our guts, it goes to our, it also goes to our heart, it also goes to our lungs. And so when something happens, like we see somebody injured or we feel threatened, we go, ah. But then that nerve is a two-way channel. 
So that uh, goes back up that nerve called the vagus nerve and gets amplified and then gets more uh. And then after a while, we're in a chronic state of uhness, that we're having difficulties with our guts, we have difficulty eating, we have difficulty um, uh, resting and feeling calm and sleeping well. So, you know, maybe I just give you a little exercise right now because my hope is to just also give you some simple tools that you can use, again, without tools, trauma rules, and with the right tools and with practice to make a really, really big difference. And so, the, again, we get this, uh, it gets, uh, goes up to the brain stem, gets amplified, goes down again, uh, and you feel like crap. And you feel all turned up in your body, in your gut, in your guts, and in your heart. Actually, the Charles Darwin, the person who really um, discovered the uh, the, um, the basic survival survival of the species, right? The species, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he 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 really understood this nerve. And he called it the pneumogastric nerve. So in other words, gastric guts, pneumo lungs. And he said that this is the, the nerve that's responsible for gut wrench and heartbreak. Pretty amazing, huh? Yes. That was in like the 1860s. Yeah. And so what happens is this, this nerve hijacks us and leaves us feeling constantly in distress. So I discovered a very simple exercise that can help people move out of that yuck, that shut down that, that state and come back a little bit more into their own aliveness, their own being. And so again, you have the feedback loop. Yuck, 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 yuck. So you wanna send a new signal from the gut back up to the brain that says, it's okay. As they would say here in Switzerland, Switzerland, all is good. The threat is over and I can relax. So the idea, and I'll demonstrate it, and any of you who want to join me, please be free. And the idea is taking an easy full breath and on, an, on the exhalation, making the sound of the voo a sustained vu as it's coming from, as though coming from the belly well it is coming from the belly and the idea again is to get a new signal from the gut instead of saying yeah this is terrible i'll never survive it's saying oh even though i'm not in a good situation i actually can feel better about myself and help other people feel better so the idea is to take an easy, and I'll demonstrate it and explain it a little bit, and then we can do it together. So the idea is to take a full, easy breath. And on the exhalation, make the sound voo, as though it's coming here in your belly. And make the sound voo, and just letting the whole sound and the breath go all the way out. And then waiting for the next breath to come in, filling belly and chest, and then repeat. So I'll do it a couple of times and again uh you you're really welcome to join and it can bring up different sensations and feelings well that's that's part of its benefit so just to know that but also know that you can handle i mean if you've been in prison you know you can handle a lot of shit and so you know that already and i know you'll be able to handle any feeling sensations or feelings or emotions that come up and I'll say a little bit more about the emotions, but here's the, here's the uh, idea. Easy, full breath. Ooh, and I vibrate it right in my belly. Ooh, ooh. Wait for the breath to come in, so belly and chest, and repeat. And just notice whatever you're experiencing, sensations, feelings, inner images, thoughts, anything that goes on in your mind and in your body. 
just be curious. And you can do it like I did it for two times. I usually suggest doing it just one or two times at first and then gradually add to it. I say because the reason is it can fortunately bring up different sensations and feelings. That's part of its benefit. But again, the idea is making that sound right there in the guts that then relay that new message up to the brain that says, that is done. We can come back, we can settle, we can feel peace. And say one other thing um, about my limited experience of, of working with prisoners. Uh, must have been in the 70s, early 70s. I did some work with a group of prisoners at San Quentin in uh, near, near San Francisco. And this was a group of men who had uh, beaten their wives or their girlfriends. Um, many of them had killed their girlfriends and they were there for life. And I was working with one of the men and this rage came up and I said, okay, just hold that for now. Don't, don't express it yet, just feel it. And then as you feel the rage, just reach your arms up like this and breathe into the rage, into the situation. And the first person I worked with he just started sobbing and sobbing. And then he said, I will never let you make, I will never let you make me feel this small again. So he was talking when he was a child and how his parents made him feel so small and that he was never gonna allow it to happen again. And then all of the people in the group were crying because they all had that shared experience. You know, I was just protecting that little child. So when we could then work, okay, let's work. What do we need to do to help that child? You know, let's think about this together. What does that child need? And how can you provide that for the child? For the child. So we're still trying to provide for the child. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, there's, the child is helpless. The child is so, so small compared to the adults, which are like giants. And again, that's this, I will never let you make me feel so small again. But again, just to hold it and feel it and not to just like act it out because that's where the problems come when they're acting out their rage. And that's when, you know, they're likely to harm somebody or, or harm themselves. Yes, in, in prison, they're in a state of fight or flight most of the time. Yes, yeah. And so they have the bodies, the bodies governing their impulses instead of the brain being online. Right, and being able to observe these difficult sensations and feelings to stand back enough. And that's, you know, I think, Many of you have probably done something with mindfulness. Well, mindful bodiness is what happens here. To use those very same tools, you know, and to, uh, to find, even though you're in, literally in prison, to find that there may be some freedom there for you. So developmental trauma, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about because yeah. this is probably where most of our traumas start, at least for the people in prison, and I know for myself. Yeah, and basically developmental means the kind of traumas that happened when we were really little. And, you know, I say that trauma is not so much just what happened to us, but what we hold inside of us in the act of an empathetic, of an empathic caregiver. So yes, we get hurt, we get scolded, we get shamed, you know, and that again just brings, you know, just crushes us. And so again, there are things that we can do to give the child somewhat of what he or she might've needed at that time. 
And so many different things happen. You know, parents, we have parents that are overly critical. We have parents that, well, if the helicopter parents, that they're always, you know, they don't give the child any autonomy. Then we have the child that doesn't get any reflection from the parent because children need that. Actually, newborns are already trying to engage their parents, their caregivers. They're looking at them, they're smiling, and they're then trying to evoke that smile. And so the parent and the child become like one interactive unit. And when we have that, again, we feel, we feel right in the world. We feel the, right, the world is good, the world is giving. Yeah. Yes, and when you're in solitary confinement or when your parents neglect you, you don't have that back and forth, that, that responsiveness right. and ability to see yourself in your mother or in the world. That's right, we re like mirrors, they are like mirrors. We reflect each other. And again, that's so important in our basic worldview after that. Is the world gonna be given or is the world a place that where there's no resources for us, that we just have pet pain? So yeah, all of these things are very, very powerful. And also, you know, when kids are around 18 months to two, two years, two, two and a half, two quarter years, um, that's when they become curious about everything that's in the world. And it's wonderful that the parents can then, you know, play with them and read together with them. But it's also, um, it's also a time when young children need to be restrained. Right. You know, because you can get into a lot of problems. So, you know, when the kid is doing something that's dangerous or not acceptable, like pulling the tail of the cat or the dog or putting their fingers in their sister's eyes, the caregiver, the parent has to say no. And then the child goes like this. But then the parent needs to say, uh, you are loved, I love you, but you can't do what you just did. So a repair takes place. And again, that's so important because again, that leads to the shame-based personality and leads to all kinds of addictions and including alcoholism. And we just feel tremendous shame. Like we're, it's not even shame, but it's, it's we're not good. We're, we are bad. We feel just badness. And again, I suspect that many of you have pulled that experience inside. So again, I hope that this is useful for you, Fritzi, for your organization, that you can carry out some of this work in the prison system because it's needed. And you know, and it's a no-brainer in a way. Uh, I te teach a lot in Europe. I am actually in Switzerland right now. I'm in Zurich, and so I did a lot of teaching in Denmark, and I taught for about five years uh, a. Uh, a prison facility in the north of Denmark. And it was very interesting. Uh, the rooms, you know, instead of bars, there was glass and then embedded in glass with these very thin wires so you could see out, but it didn't seem like you were totally in prison. You could look out in the back and see trees. And then beyond the trees, there was a high wall so people couldn't escape, but they also didn't feel like they were completely confined. So again, I work with the whole team of people who do therapy with the prisoners because they do. They get individual therapy, I think twice a week. They get group therapy almost every day. It's really amazing. You know what the recidivism rate is in that hospital? 6%. Wow, compared to our 65% in the US. More, at least 65. At least for the first three years, 77% after five years. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, and, and other countries are doing so much better. Germany is also doing it better. And I mean, I guess there's, you know, there are issues around private, you know, private prisons, but still anything, if they invest in some kind of healing for the prisoners, they're really, they're really doing such benefit to society. Absolutely. And the groups, meeting in groups, why is that so important? I know why it's important, but can you tell us why you think it's so important? Okay. 
Remember that nerve I talked about, the vagus nerve? So we have basically three systems in our bodies, in our brain and our bodies, and nervous system and body. The, the three systems are fight or flight, you're on edge, hypervigilant, you know, scanning for constant danger. The other one is this vagus nerve, which gives you this blech. It takes the energy out of us and we feel down. There's a third system, and that system involves our lung muscles in our throat, the teeny muscles in our middle ear, and uh, our, our, our facial expression, particularly our eyes. And when we're in that mode, we want contact with others. Even on Zoom, what we're doing here, you and I are both just demonstrating that clearly right now. We're in contact with each other, with ourselves, we're in contact with each other. And that ability really conveys the sense of safety. Stephen Porges, whose basic theory this is, uh, calls this neuroception. Do you, do you perceive the world as being dangerous and threatening? Do you feel like the, the world is just overwhelming that you have no energy? Or does it feel supportive for you to be with other people, to connect with other people and to feel that benefit of contacting and being with other people. You know, again, I, I, I only know a little bit about what it's like in the inside. And that's mostly from what I learned from my father, but also doing some work in hospitals. And I would say you folks could really, really do a lot of good for society by getting healed and helping to support each other and heal each other. So a lot of times doing this exercise, if you do it with somebody else, it's deeper. It gives us more of the social engagement system. And, you know, there's a Motown song. It takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. So by being able, by doing this with, with each other, that one person does the who and then the other person is there present. Is that empathic witness? And then you reverse the roles. You know, you'd be surprised at what a difference something simple like that can make. And then after that, just to make eye contact with that person. Just to just be there, to not have to do anything but to look, to sense, to feel, to feel rhythm to feel rhythm in our voice, to feel rhythm in our ears, to feel connection with our eyes. So I just look forward to hearing Fritzi what some of those things, how you implement them and, and what the outcomes can be. Absolutely. I saw a little bit about your work, you know, in the documentary and that's great. Again, you know, I'm a hundred percent behind that because that's really what's going to make society a better and a safer place. We think we're, we're getting safety by putting, putting people in prison and God knows to put them in solitary confinement. In terms of this nervous system reception, that's really the worst possible thing you could do. You really are destroying some of these people, especially when this is done with young, you know, adolescents and even some pre-adolescents. It's, it's really horrific. Um, but anyhow, the opposite of, uh, you know, of, oh God, what's it? Again? Solitary. Solitary confinement is interactive, is being with each other. So this is something really, really to practice and to write about the benefit that it gives you. I, I, I really suggest people uh, write, you know, and, and document a little bit what they've been feeling, what happened, what happens afterwards. So, yeah. You know, and it's interesting. That, yeah. I'm sorry, what did you just, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, and to share that with each other. Absolutely. What's interesting about the VU exercise is it sounds a lot like the OM um, that the monks do or the, or when you meditate and I, the power, we do that in, in our group in, in prison. When we were in prison, we would all do ohm and it, you could feel the shift in the energy yeah, after yeah. doing that a few times right. yeah you know yes ohm it's different than ohm actually right and, and ohm is really good 
V, v is definitely from the gut. Uh -huh. Om is more from the from the heart, from the chest. So I would work first with the vu, and then go to the om, and even to open the throat more to the ah uh, ah. Uh -huh. uh. Now look, sounds like this have been around for literally tens of thousands of years, and it wouldn't still be going around if it didn't do something really beneficial. So figure on that. But this is just specific type of sounding to, to trigger that nerve to, be, to, to go to the safety um, setting, the safety default setting. Fantastic. And add in the ohm. Um, you say in your book, you say the ability to effectively contain and process extreme emotional states is one of the linchpins both of effective truly dynamical trauma therapy and of living a vital, robust life. Great, where, 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 what book is that in? Uh, I've, I believe that's Trauma and Memory, but it could be yeah. wow. uh, oh, in spoken, spoken voice. voice. I, I'm sorry, they all just blended. Sometimes people quote what I said and I said, wow, and I said, at first of all, somebody will quote it and won't say it, that it where they got it from. And I say, that is so right on, totally right on. And then they say, oh, yeah, I got that in Waking the Tiger. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, but the idea is to get to being back to our normal, our original state. Yes. You know, and even if we didn't have that interaction to, to enough degree with our, with our caregivers, with our parents, you know, this back and forth uh, singing to each other, you know, using the throat to, oh, you are just love I just love you so much sweetheart that even that can come decades later and even in starting to do exercises like this yeah yeah a lot of the men that I've worked with say they've you know that we're treating them better than their parents would treat them right. and you know it just breaks my heart because I know those parents don't really want to do that but they don't have the ability to get out of the state. Of course, because it, it, they didn't have it when they were little children. Absolutely. But there is a way to break that cycle of damage and go into a cycle of grace. Mm. And what is that way? What what is What is your vision for that? Well, it's really connecting to that deep self and then also being mirrored and mirroring another person. You know, because that's exactly what should have happened when we were really teeny. And it can still happen as adults. And even in adverse situations, like imprisonment. I really believe that. I mean, my experience is definitely yes. But again, you, you, you're doing that work already. And I hope just this a little bit adds to it. Well, they actually are, could be, Prisons could be f formed as a family instead of mm -hmm. a yeah, yeah. an adversarial yeah. uh, fight or flight ground. Yeah, uh, they could um, work to work with each other to find harmony and to heal each other. Yeah. Um, one of the things that happened to me recently: um, the kitchen in my house has always been a trauma zone. When I grew up, my mother. Um, she was very violent in the kitchen. She had a knife uh, and she would yell uh, at me. So I, I have a 14 year old. Uh, and so when I would be in the kitchen, I, I didn't even, even understand what was going on, but I would kind of tense up and I would sometimes be unable to talk, be unable to speak in the kitchen. And right. just, just- Your body remembers, your body is remembering. Exactly. And um, a few months ago, my son was playing with a peanut butter jar and he dropped it on the floor and it, it was a loud noise and I screamed. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of days ago, he was unloading the dishwasher and he broke a bowl and I didn't react uh -huh. because I've been doing this work. Right, right, yeah, you taking the fang out of the, out of the uh, uh, you know, out of the trigger. Yes, but he reacted and I saw him go from fight flight into kind of like um fr frozen he went he went frozen. to freeze yeah. and yeah 
And and he was so um it kind of like took him out for a few hours. It was mm -hmm. devastating to him. That's right. That's right. But you knew that it was devastating. Yeah. That's the difference. Yes. Because yes. then from there you can do something. Well, and I I said, Are you yeah. okay, honey? And I hugged yeah. him. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. but I'm basically reparenting him and I'm reparenting myself because I'm yeah. giving to him what I never got as a child. That's right. And that's a bit of a miracle, isn't it? That we can give to each other, give to ourselves and give to each other things that we didn't get or didn't get an adequate amount of. Because often we think we didn't get anything. But when we kind of look at it a little bit more carefully, we did get something. I mean, even in abuse families, you know, there were positive, you know, parts to this. So we don't want to deny them. But it, of course, but at the same time, uh, you know, we need to recognize, we do, you do recognize where the wounding is and have made a commitment not to pass it on to the next generation. Yeah, even though I have passed some of it on, but I'm, it's definitely a commitment. And yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's right. It's a, definitely a commitment. And it's like really doing it and doing it and doing it. So it's a question now about memory, because like you said, sometimes we just remember the bad things instead mm -hmm. of, because trauma is very, um, it's amorphous sometimes. We don't know what, what we're remembering. My sister has a different version of her child of what happened in our household than yeah. I do. And um, it, it's almost completely two different stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? You know, and I, I do that with my brother sometimes also. And I've learned so many different things, you know, that I didn't know, and I, you know, said things to them that they, they didn't know. But it's, again, it's a really wonderful sharing. And to know that there is no one truth. Right, and even, I mean, as we're pr processing our memories, as we're going through our traumas, it may not have actually happened, but it still feels real. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly, exactly. You know, I, yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, I've written about that in, you know, in uh, Trauma and Memory, because memories can be unreliable. They are very often very unreliable. And so uh, what can we do to not get caught in justifying this memory or justifying our reaction to this memory, but again, to see how it's got locked in our bodies and to let it go, let there be more freedom, more self-care, more care of others. And there's another quote I have, I'm going to read. It's this one is definitely from in, in, in spoke, an in, unspoken voice. The ability to feel the physical sensations of paralysis, because you say that when we're traumatized, we it's from being immobilized. That's right. That's right. What you described, you know, when the when the yeah, and what what, what happened to your son? Yeah, that's immobilization, right? Exactly. And feeling like you can't escape a situation, like being held down. That's that's right. Or being yeah. with a parent who you have to live there, you can never leave. Yeah. So you say the ability to feel the physical sensations of paralysis without becoming overwhelmed and surrender to them is the key in transforming trauma. When yeah. we are able to touch into that death-like void, even briefly, rather than recoil from it, the immobilization releases. Boy, yeah, that's right on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right on, Peter. Yes. Yeah, you know, again, uh, you know, without tools, trauma certainly rules us. But with the tools and with support from a caring other, and uh, maybe I'm uh, really talking about you and your colleagues, um, things can really change that seem like they were fixed, but they can shift. You know, the expression shift happens. Shift happens, yes. And um, w one more thing, there's a couple of um, concepts you have, um, pendulation. Yes, yes. 
Yes, probably if I'm known for anything in uh, posterity, it's that called pendulation. Because whenever we contract, we contract in trauma. So there's a contraction. And we tend to stay contracted when the trauma is happening too much, too fast, too long, without support. So we get stuck here, we get stuck in contraction. And when people first start to feel their sensation, it feels, they feel worse. It's like the contraction gets even more. But if we're guided very gently, that contraction then moves to an expansion, then a contraction again and into a greater expansion and a contraction and into freedom, freedom. Yeah. Which you actually, from that place, you talk about spirituality and trauma and how mm -hmm. spirituality is one of the doorways to, I mean, trauma is one of the doorways right. yeah, yeah. Uh, to bliss, I guess, or- It's even bliss, but about being present, of being in the, really being able to be in the here and now. Um, I don't know about bliss. I mean, there's certainly positive affective states, but it really is about, um, it, it, it's about not being stuck, even though it feels like we're stuck, to know that if we even move into it just a little bit more, then we will naturally, organically start to come out and then again, we'll find that we go into it a little bit more this time, and then we go out a little bit more. And again, this I call pendulation. And it's just that following every contraction, there will be an expansion. And for every expansion, there will also be a contraction. And when we hold contraction and expansion together, that's when I think we have a bona fide spiritual experience, really. It's holding them together. Not one or the other, but to hold them together. Okay, so it's going back just a tad, another quote from you. You say, trauma sufferers are so frightened of their bodily sensations that they can recoil from feeling them. It is as they believe that by feeling them, they will be destroyed or yeah. at the very least make things worse. Hence, they remain stuck. So you said that. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> but, so that's kind of what we're talking about is, is the, in, it's not, it's the reluctance to want to go into those feelings. That's right. Because we're afraid that we'll feel worse, but we will for a moment, because we've been, you know, cut off from those feelings. So as we get to, to touch them for the first time, it, it does feel worse. And that's when we say, I don't want to have anything to do with this. But again, when we're guided, we then again find out that we move, yes, into more contraction, but then slowly into an expansion. And then again, and again. And then that's where people really want to be. That's where we all want to be is- That's is, where we all want to be. And which, we have a right, a birthright to be there. So, um, you mentioned in another one of your interviews that when you arrive in the United States, you see people are much more fearful. Oh. Yeah, it's, un it's unreal. It's really unreal. You know, even if I've come to a place where there's been a lot of violence, a lot of violence, I see people there are less frightened than people here. And I'm not sure what it's all about, but I think it, some of it has to do with compared to most of the Western uh, democracies, um, we, many people know that if something happens beyond their control, they may be in poverty, they may be living on the street. So we don't have enough of that welfare. This is something you definitely don't see in most of the European countries. You absolutely don't see it in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, there's much less, you know, it's not as, as solid, but in Switzerland and in Germany, I was mentioning the prison, you know, uh, work in both those countries. Um, yeah, I mean, 
to, to feel our own wholeness and to share it, I think that's what life is about. And that's what, for me, what life is about. To fear, fear our own, to feel our own wholeness and share yep. it. Yes. Yep. No matter what the situation is, even if the situation is being in prison. But you know, we can be more in prison with our sensations and our emotions than being actually in prison. And anyhow, that's the one that we have some, we do have control over. We do have control over that. We may not have control of where we are, like in the prison, but we do have control over our own sense of being and quality of life. Yes, it, it just doesn't matter where you are, you can heal. That's right. That's right. And again, I, I don't want to make it sound like you know, prison is no big deal because it's a really big deal, really. But it's also true that we can be at peace within ourselves, even in a situation like that. You know, I know some of the people who have been doing mindfulness work in prison are finding those same kinds of things. I was talking the other day with Jack Cornfield and we, we chatted about that a bit. Because we both worked in prisons. Um, I'd love to have Jack on this show as well. Um, another another concept you brought up was that you say people decide to act only after their brain unconsciously prepares them to do so. Um, this was another part of your book where you're talking about how mm. we do things almost before we're the brain is the brain the, uh -huh. the conscious brain is actually doing something. Right. And so it's about, I think what I'm understanding is it's about getting to that unconsciousness so that you're not reacting. You're not in fight or you're not, you don't go and kill that person. You don't go and hurt That's that right. person. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. so how do we, how do we get that mindfulness? Well, I mean, I think that's what we're talking about. And there, there are not, this is not, there's not just one path. There are many pathways, but you know, it's right when you feel it, when it feels right because it is right for you right and it's it's uh it's kind of like when my my son dropped the bowl mm -hmm. and i finally didn't react like the world didn't affect me like it yeah. usually does yeah yeah and that's when you know you're going in the right direction right there's an exercise called the self hug i'm wondering if you could yeah if you could tell us about that this is very simple. Again, I give it to anybody who wants to use it. Completely gratis, completely free. And it's just like taking our hands and putting our hands on our upper arms and gently giving a little bit of a squeeze and then releasing the squeeze a little bit, very gently, and then squeezing again and releasing. And it's like holding what we feel all of those difficult sensations and emotions. And it's also, as we, as we um, uh, squeeze a little bit our, on our muscles, that's the contraction. And then releasing a little bit, that's the expansion. So we just carry that basic idea with us everywhere. This is so wonderful because I can feel it. I can feel it yeah. calming my body. Absolutely. And a lot of people in prison never had had to learn how to self-soothe. That's right, that's right. And the, if, the more you can help them learn that, the more they're gonna feel right. And in their right mind. In, in their right mind. In, in their, their right, right mind. mind. That's right, right. absolutely, absolutely. Well, Dr. Levine, it's been such an honor to have you here. Is there any other um, bits of wisdom you wanna share with our well, audience. Again, I just would say that trauma is a fact of life. It doesn't just affect people in war zones or natural disasters. Most all of us have experienced significant degrees of trauma. There's no question about it. So trauma is a fact of life, but the good news is it doesn't have to be a life sentence. So I just leave you with that thought. Thank you so much, Dr. Levine. It's been an honor to have you with us today. Oh, gladly, gladly, Fritzi. I'm so grateful to have spoken with Dr. Peter Levine. What a wise and incredibly kind 
generous and informed man about trauma. This conversation will be shared with both the people in prison and with the community at large. And as usual, please go to our website, CompassionPrisonProject.org. Watch and share Step Inside the Circle. And please donate if you feel compelled to. Thank you again for watching.